Hey guys, Richard at Reefs.com. Thank you for joining me today. Today, I would like to give you a trip, a tour of a, this magical place called Florida Coral Rescue Center that is an effort, coalition efforts in between Disney, SeaWorld, and many other entities out there that is trying to make a difference in saving the precious corals of Florida Reef Track. Let's go. My name is Sarah. I'm a senior coral biologist here at the Florida Coral Rescue Center. I work for SeaWorld, but this place is a collaboration between a lot of different partners, such as the AZA, FWC, the Foundation of Florida Wildlife, as well as Disney and a few other partnerships. So we all work together here to make sure that the Florida corals are being taken care of. The Sony coral tissue loss disease has really wiped out a lot of the Florida corals and so it's important that we work to protect the ones that are left. So these corals here have been taken from the ocean by FWC ahead of the disease line and we're helping to keep them alive so they can grow and thrive and eventually spawn. Here we have 18 different tubs of tanks. Uh, there are 18 species of corals in this they're all stony corals. So those are the reef building corals that build that structure in Florida Coral Reef. And they're all being decimated by that disease. So here we haven't seen signs of that disease because they were ahead of the disease line, but we are working on keeping them safe and healthy while they're here with us. We have five different systems of water. So four of these tubs share all one filtration system, and that helps us to keep things separate or kind of do things in a systematic way. So we'll feed one system every day, then the next day we'll clean that system, and the day after that we'll clean those filter socks. So it kind of helps keep things in a cycle. Um, one system is 1,500 gallons mm -hmm. total, so one, one tank is about 300 gallons of water. Gotcha. You know, I remember when this was being built because this farm used to be Worldwide Coral's farm when they were first beginning, right? Yes, exactly. Worldwide Coral had this. When they needed to expand, we were able to take over, which was a really good timing and really helpful for us. Um, they were really generous with allowing us to use some of the equipment that was still here. So we just sanitized it, cleaned it, um, and changed a couple things. But for the most part, this is how it was set up when it was Worldwide Coral's. Mm -hmm. um, it worked for them, so it's also working for us. So you have a very different type of corals here. What kind of corals are these? Um, these are all corals from Florida. They are mm -hmm. stony corals. So some of them are brain corals. That's kind of a general term with a few species within it. Um, we have brain corals, we have boulder corals, mm -hmm. we have maize corals, which look like a maize as the name implies. But there are 18 different species. So we have quite a, quite a variety here. There's 20 species total that are really affected by the disease and so some of the other facilities that are in this project have those other two species. What are your plans for holding on to these corals? Now are you just holding it for like a seed bank or do you have plans to release them in the wild later? Yeah so these are mainly a gene bank. They're our library of genetic code for these corals. So right now we're keeping them alive. We're working really hard to allow them to grow and thrive mm -hmm. and then eventually we'll work on spawning them and having their babies grow until they're a certain size and then with FWC and a few other partners we'll be able to outplant them back into the ocean. So these here will basically stay as a gene library yeah. to continuously spawn and reproduce to put back into the ocean. Can you tell me a little bit more about these over here? Yeah sure. So these small tanks are 10 gallons each and this is where we're working right now on having some of our larvae that were released from one of our species settle out. So in this first one here, we have some, some baby larvae kind of floating around and we'll put tiles in there later on today to allow them to settle onto the tiles, little tiny tiles, which we then put into some of our larger systems um, where they'll grow larger. Um, these other three tanks here right now, they don't have anything in them really besides snails. Um, these, these kind of column pieces are a few different substrates that we're testing out to see what the preference is for the babies to settle on. So there's a little bit of a different composition between each of those pieces. And once they are seasoned and they have some coralline algae on them, we'll start adding babies to those tanks to see which, which composition they prefer the most. Um, so that eventually when we are 
reproducing and spawning on a larger scale, we can use that um, information to be able to settle at a better percentage. As far as the lighting goes, we use Radeons. Right now we have generation four and five, and they are set to basically mimic Key West sunrise and sunset, as well as moonrise and moonset, because most of these corals work were taken around the Key West area, so it gives them the most natural setting for them. And that will help in the future when we do move on to spawning. It's already kind of given them in the right, the right sink for releasing their, their larvae or sperm and eggs. And so the lighting is all set for that. The flow, we use MP40s by Ecotech, and we have them on a few different settings, and we're able to adjust that flow. So. Each of these species in Florida have different preferences for flow. Some like it less, some like it more. So we can constantly change the MP40 to be a lesser or higher flow um, or move the corals to, to be able to change that as well. But the flow really allows coral tissue to release any waste or gain you know, that, the nutrients that are in the water. So it's really important for the coral tissue to have that turnover of flow, whether it's low or high. So that also helps with distributing some of the foods that we feed in the morning. Um, we come here uh, at 6 a.m. before the lights turn on and we use headlamps to feed the corals in the dark because they are naturally nocturnal or most of our species are nocturnal. So they, they release their feeder tentacles at night better than in the daytime. So we'll use some broadcast foods such as reproids and a few other things, polyp booster by polyp labs. Um, to kind of get them, you know, jump started and, and ready to accept that food. And so having the flow within the tank allows that to get distributed as well. Um, so for some of our larger polyp corals, we'll use a turkey baster and kind of target feed those mouths with Pacifica krill, which is basically just a small shrimp or a few different types of food that we might want to try and offer them. So it allows us to give them that nutrition that they need, that they're not normally getting from from the ocean water um, so between the lights and us feeding them they're getting all of their energy either directly from the food or through photosynthesis with their zooxanthellae using the sunlight from these lights so that's really really critical for them to stay alive and grow and not bleach and it also allows them to have the best water quality that's available gotcha and then how often is uh, do you guys do water change um, so we typically will do a water change on these systems the day after we feed. So we'll allow them to feed in the morning and take up all that nutrition and expel any waste that they have. And then the next day we'll do a water change on that system. So no matter where we live, whether we're close to the ocean or in the middle of the United States, near, nowhere near the ocean, we all have a direct impact on what's happening in the ocean. So any um, anything that we can do to help these corals could be like reducing our plastic usage or only fertilizing when it's you know the correct time of year when it's not super rainy. Um, we're working on trying to reduce any energy that we don't need to be using in our homes like lights or keeping the fridge open while we're doing something. Like trying to minimize any impact that we have is directly helping these corals that are in Florida, whether you live in Florida or not. So anything that you can do at home is helping to save these corals as well. The future for us here is hopefully to keep expanding because these corals are really important and they are growing, which is awesome, but we need more room to be able to keep them and to allow them to spawn and reproduce. It takes a lot of space and a lot of funding. So eventually we would like to keep expanding so that we can have a bigger role in this project as well and give as much help as we can. Once again, my name is Sarah. I am a senior coral biologist for SeaWorld and I thank you so much for watching and for coming by the Florida Coral Rescue Center. Thank you.